The war in Gaza is dividing the world. The Hamas terrorist attacks of October the 7th killed more than a 1,000 people, mostly civilians, and many hostages are still being held. And yet since then, the Israeli response has killed an even greater number of Palestinians. And there are growing accusations from the global south that the West is ignoring the plight of the people of Gaza. One of the leading voices expressing this view is Anwar Ibrahim. He's the Prime Minister of Malaysia, and he's a leader who maintains links with Hamas. We talked to him here in Berlin, drilling down into his views not just on this, but on why he also rejects other elements of Western world views. Now, this is such a complex and controversial web of issues, so you'll find some extra context throughout the interview in case any terms or bits of background are unfamiliar. Prime Minister Anwar, many thanks for speaking to DW today. Um, you've been speaking a lot over the course of this week, um, powerfully, uh, with accusations of hypocrisy towards the West in its approach um, to the crises going on around the world. And I think with particular reference to the war in Gaza and comparing it to the war in Ukraine and comparing the Western responses to these two conflicts. Um, could you just explain the view that, that you've been expressing? No, I'm expressing the sentiments and feelings of many people in the global south that uh, they want peace, they want justice, and there should not be a um, discriminatory uh, practice uh, or judging uh, areas and bias. Uh, that's why I call it hypocrisy, because um, they seem to be very tough uh, on Ukraine. And we have expressed the same thing. We were against any aggression, any conquest by any country. Right. Now, with that, so why is it so difficult even to call for a ceasefire in uh, Gaza? And how is it you can tolerate 60 years of atrocities, of dispossession, of land being taken? I mean, that was the, the only thing that I need to call upon uh, the West to uh, consider. And at the same time, we, to, we, we talk about rapprochement, understanding between East and West, respect the multiculturalism. And it doesn't work that way. People become more disillusioned and distrusting of political leaders. Now, um, Germany and the broader West position, their position has been very much with respect to Gaza that Israel has the right to defend itself against the terrorist attack, as they see it, that was mounted by Hamas, a group that they see also as a terrorist group, um, on October the 7th. Um, do you reject that as any uh, justification for the Western view on things? What about colonization of the last 50, 60 years? What about the dispossession? What about the land being taken? What about the killings of children on a daily basis by the settlers taking people's land and property? Is that not relevant? While humanity is only, uh, and justice and uh, atrocity is only committed on the 7th of October and nothing before that? Why, will, why is it that, that the West can tolerate for 50 years of this ridiculous atrocity? I mean, these are questions that need to be raised. People are not naive, you see. Nobody wants to uh, condone any sort of atrocity by anyone. You know? But the country is colonized, all the war against colonialism all throughout these decades and centuries in Vietnam, in Algeria, in South Africa, Pathai, do you talk about atrocities committed by the freedom fighters? You don't. Why give an exception to Hamas? But there's a point. Do I therefore condone? And no. How do you stop Hamas mentality? Stop the colonialism or colonization. Why, why can't we, we, we look at it in a comprehensive manner how to resolve? Not from the dictates of the capitals of Europe and the uh, United States. Not all capitals, fortunately. But why? You see, that's the point. I'm not condoning any uh, atrocity. But the, the point is that you seem to be very selective. It's like selective amnesia. You choose... Um, so people question, I mean, in the global, look at the, the narrative. Is it because they are colored 
uh, is it because they are Muslims or there are many Christians in, in Gaza? But why is it? Why is it that you, you, you cannot have a, a, a sort of transparent, consistent, coherent voice? So let's, I'd like to talk about Hamas shortly, but, but let's get, try to get specific then. So we understand the argument that you're making towards the broader West. Um, you're here in Germany. Um, is this behavior, are these positions that you see in Germany, do you, do you feel that in the German position there is hypocrisy, this hypocrisy that you describe? Well, um, let, let's say this, that uh, okay, Germ uh, Germany uh, stands to have this psyche of the millstone antecedent what ha happened against the Jews and the Holocaust, which, which I condemn, okay? because uh, no community, including the Jews, should be treated in that manner, period. So you have a special relation with Israel. That's your right, it's not a question. But I'm questioning from 47, 48 Nakba. Why, why is it so difficult to take a position Yes, you want to protect the security of Israel, but why must uh, we be muted when it comes to atrocities against another people, another race, another group? So, so let's be more specific. So, so Germany, of course, it does say that it has a historical responsibility towards the Jewish people, towards the state of Israel, as a result of the crimes of the Holocaust. You already referred to that. And this has been reiterated in recent months in the current situation, and this is part of the background um, for Germany's position. But Germany has been critical of settlements. It has been critical um, of, it is drawing a, a clearer line about what it sees as acceptable behavior. It is becoming more critical. Um, do you feel that Germany still has to do more, just staying specifically on Germany for now? Well, I did uh, acknowledge uh the uh, position taken by Germany now it is calling for immediate ceasefire and increased humanitarian assistance to Gaza. But certainly it's not enough because you're a bit silent the fact that con continued attacks on the innocent lives in Gaza on the pretext of Hamas. So Hamas becomes a bulky person. Whether they are there or not, whether they've been killed or not is irrelevant. But the fact that you must completely destroy and kill children, women, and civilians, and and I, I, that's why I use the term hypocrisy. Um, I can't I can't understand. Neither can I rationalize this. But of course, I did acknowledge positively the statement by Chancellor Scholz, for example, calling for ceasefire and stop this war and return of hostages. I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem with that. But why? But why this complete uh, silence and? Tolerance of continued atrocities pre 7th October and post 7th October. Use the narrative the West is not accepted by the entire world. That is the point. It's not Malaysia. I choose to say it because I think it's a matter of conscience. I, I went through hell in my life. I know what solitary confinement is, I know what injustice is. So I, I thought that it is only proper that I speak up. But many of my colleagues wanted to do that for fear, for concerns, for economic uh, uh, survival, whatever reasons. Before moving on to the, the next kind of area of questions, just to be specific again, so your accusation of hypocrisy, I mean, you welcome some of the steps that Germany has made recently, but your accusation of hypocrisy does apply to Germany as well as the wider West? Well, at least before the final decision that is calling for a cessation uh, of, 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 of atrocities or, or the attack on, on Gaza, specifically now Rafa, and calling for an increased humanitarian assistance. But even then, the people are getting cynical. Yes, do increase, so we send some support. But then the, the bombings continue. Well, we will issue us a polite statement to say, you know, stop these bombings. You mean to say the entire Europe and America 
cannot wield that influence that will stop the war. Nobody believe it. So what's your request to Germany? What should it do? They have, they have, they have um, been more assertive lately, but I think they should uh, you know, work within the EU and uh, coordinate with the United States and other countries to just insist, just stop the killing. People cannot accept it. I mean, generally, I mean, I don't know how people see it. I've, I've also mixed around here, I went to the and I met community, met a lot of think, think tanks and scholars this morning. Because people, no right-minded person with any conscience for humanity would want to, this to continue. Now let's move to, on to talk about Hamas. You, we've mentioned it already. Um, you have said in recent days that you make no apologies for the fact that Malaysia and your government has relations with Hamas. Um, even though it did murder more than a thousand civilians in early October, on October the 7th. Can you just explain to people who might think, how could you have relations with a group like that that conducts a terrorist atrocity like that? How could you maintain friendly relations with them? I'll respond to that. Before that, I will, I will ask this question. Um, and, and this will be a response from leaders in Europe and the States. How do you continue to engage and respect and honor and give credit to Netanyahu and the government of Israel for the continued killing of 30,000 children, women and civilians. Yeah, but we're asking you the questions today. We want to understand your views. Yeah, yeah so, I want to get so the, the context the, the, right. The, yeah. And not only that, for the f decades, that's why I see the, the, the thing is, Polite word would be contradiction. The frank uh, statement would be hypocrisy. You see? Now, you, why do I engage with Hamas? The political wing with Hamas, not the military wing. Because they, they were the legitimate representative, at least partly, of the, of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And, uh, but if I may interject, I mean, that was an election held in 2006. Yes. I mean, yes. that's almost 20 years ago. Right, but, but till then, we have to deal with them. When we discuss with uh, Myanmar, we discuss the military junta. Is that a question? Is that an issue? Is, well, it, is that a legitimate representation of the people of, North Co uh, of, of Myanmar? Well, 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 the Exide government would say no to, on the case of Myanmar. Yeah. But let's stay on Hamas. So that's why I see this, this, these contradictions abound. What, what I mean is, okay, if you don't want to speak to Hamas, whom do you speak to? So given the limitations at present, when a, a country, an area is colonized and harassed a daily basis, you talk about democratic elections. You don't talk about the killings. You don't talk about the dispossession. You don't talk about the land being taken. You don't talk about the children being killed. You don't talk about the schools being destroyed. And that's my contention. Now, um, and then of course, Hamas uh, is a terrorist group. I will ask you, I mean, uh, Germany's colonized countries, uh, the French or the Italians, all the freedom fighters resort to ways that you cannot defend under normal international rule. But it happened, yes. Mandela is a great hero. Yeah, but Mandela didn't order the killing of a thousand people. Well, you better pick up your history. Because Mandela was part of the ANC and part of the ANC were involved in some of these actions. But people accept that because the way they were treated, you know, discriminated, killed and dispossessed. So, so if I could drill down on this, then are you suggesting that because of the way that Gaza has been treated, um, that the 7th of October is justifiable, maybe not understandable? W w w explain 
more about where you're coming from. But this is why I said uh, this uh, narrative here. This narrative is the mantra of 7th October. Uh, to some people in the West who are completely, um, I should say, oblivious to the facts and the realities, uh, ignorant of history or just um, amnesia. I mean, I'm talking about the 60 years of atrocity. For goodness sake, deal with it. Yeah. But and we say, no, 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 we don't care about the 60 years. We don't care about the thousands killed before. To us, what is important is the 7th October. I say that's to you, not to me. Yeah. To me, before October, 7th October, after October, are all relevant in this discourse. And we must deal with it in a comprehensive manner and settle. Yeah. How can we talk about humanity? We talk about, about freedom of people, about the children. You mean only children, the white children of Israel is relevant, not the coloured in uh, Palestine? What is the issue? What is the basis that you can condone the action of a killing of 30,000 plus, 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 but you cannot condone another action? Do you ask me, I don't condone any killings of children, or women or civilians. And of course, nor do we. We're simply trying to peel open your opinion, yeah, so that no, no, our viewers I, can understand. I, understand. I hope you I'm understand that, Prime Minister. I'm responding. I mean, I'm not but, I'm responding. But, this. but and Deutsche Welle has done very extensive coverage of the full gamut of, of the, the conflict, um, including settlements and including the situation in Gaza. Um, but I just want to, again, come back to understanding your view and the reason why you say it's legitimate to have good relations with Hamas. Um, so as far as I understand, you, you are essentially saying that what happened on the 7th of October, the taking of hostages and those killings, is understandable in the context of this long conflict. Is, am I putting words in your Not mind? condoned. Yeah. But, but, uh, but of course understandable because people have been uh, uh, victimized in so long. So, but but my, my response is this. The, the fact that uh, and the, the other state killed 30,000 people is not relevant. You can still engage, you can still praise. But the other side, because I don't know whether because they are coloured, because they are victimised, because they are seen to be different or the other, they cannot be condoned. I mean, that's my point. Mm -hmm. So if you ask uh, 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 me for comp the comprehensive solution, just stop this. Stop the killing by either by the, by the Palestinians against the Israelis or the Israelis against the Palestinians. There is a comprehensive settlement. Yeah. But why then be very selective, as if the problem has never happened? except after 7th October. This is absurd. It's an appalling display of total ignorance and attempt to erase historical facts. I think the point you're making is similar to a point that Antonio Guterres himself said uh, yes. last year, of course. So it's not that nobody in, from a Western background is saying such things. Guterres did but, not actually yeah. present Western view. He presents a, <laughs> a more course, rational... Standing for the United <laughs> Nations. But, but I just want to come back a little bit more to Hamas because I'm interested in, in how you view the kind of role that they can potentially play. Because, of course, Hamas, you know, it does say in the Hamas Charter that there is no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad. Is that any initiatives, international conferences, proposals are a waste of time and vain endeavours. Doesn't that give you, isn't that a concern that Hamas is a group that will forever be radical and will never be in a, in a place to, to try to find the kind of peaceful solution that you aspire to? Do I agree with that position? No. But the uh, next question is, why are you silent with the fact that uh, Israeli government and the Zionists talk about Greater Israel, which covers the entire Palestine area. That is why I said, in frank terms, hypocrisy. Do I agree with the Amastans? I would say no. But why are you comp completely muted when it comes to Israelis saying about great Israel, demolish the whole, their homes and don't recognize the Palestinian right. 
Yeah, well, but that does get criticised by a lot of countries in the well, international polite community. Well, polite criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Not, think the not, enough. not enough. Not the men in the narrative has been done, the condemnation against Hamas. But, but no, uh, the, the issue is not Hamas. I, it does not, to me, it does not matter whether uh, Hamas or not. If uh, you, find, you want to find and secure uh, lasting peace and resolution, the, the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, have to elect their leaders. You know? They decide for themselves. I do not, uh, I don't have the right to claim that Hamas should be re their representative. I mean, let them decide, you see. And the Israelis, they decide. I mean, people you may choose to like the present prime minister or not, but the Israelis have to decide. And then the legitimate representatives of these uh, years must then be compelled to negotiate with the supervision of, of mainly Europe and the neighbors, neighboring Arab states and, of course, the United States. Now, it, there's obviously, there is a growing desire and a growing recognition that a two-state solution is, is urgently needed, something that's been talked about for decades and never achieved. Um, Malaysia itself does not recognize Israel, does not have diplomatic relations. What is that contingent on? Like, if there is progress towards a two-state solution, are you happy to say, yes, we will be in there providing recognition to Israel at a point at which, at whatever point along that um, process, it looks like a Palestinian state is coming? We made it clear that uh, as long as you respect, recognize the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinians, and the rest will have to be recognized and supported. So I, I don't think there's any, any contradiction in that. But in as long as you have an issue where colonization continues and um, dispossession becomes the order of the day, it would be difficult to speak uh, on, you know, and, and uh, view that there is a possible amicable resolution to the problem. Uh, I mean, do you personally recognize Israel's right to exist as a state? Of course, there's for, for the international community to decide, and they've decided. The issue that we, we, we defer the recognition is because the intransigence of Israel, no respect for international law and rule. And I would recognize countries and states that would respect international rule and respect the legitimate aspirations of others, others. So do you think it was a mistake by the UAE and Bahrain as part of these Abraham Accords to, to recognize Israel? Not necessarily a mistake, when they are neighbors, there are some considerations, the security considerations, it's for them to decide. We maintain excellent relations with the UAE and the neighboring countries. And, and of course, they, I've engaged with them, they've explained, but there are different considerations. And Malaysia is far away. We can take a more nuanced and independent stance. Now, Malaysia also has good and improving ties to Iran, Hamas's major backer in the region. You met President Raisi, I think, twice in recent months. Uh, you said after your meetings that you want to see relations enhanced between Malaysia and Iran. How do you explain that? I mean, Iran is one of the most repressive regimes in the world. I mean, you said yourself you spent years in jail fighting for democracy. There are many people in Iran in jail who've been thrown into jail after protests. People have died. Do you really feel comfortable saying you want to improve relations with a government, with a country led by a government like that? Well, um, I don't view Iran from the prism of the West. Uh, yes, there are excesses. I don't uh, accept that sort of a rabid uh, condemnation of the country. We have excesses in many countries in Europe. We know how minorities have been treated. You know the growing fascism. You know what's happening to the blacks in Africa, in America. They took 
decades to be recognised. So but would you we compare... continue to respect. Why is it that for the United States is fine, but when it comes to other countries, you have a different standard? I, I, I have excellent relations with China. I'm not, I agree in every single decision of China. I have very good relations with Germany. There are some issues I differ. So I think we have to t take it in a stride. In, in, in Malaysia, we are, of course, a vibrant democracy. I believe in democracy. I believe in human rights. But um, we engage with countries, although they do not necessarily um, share the same aspirations and views. Yeah. Um, but so just to pick up on that briefly, I mean, you're comparing the situation of African-Americans in the United States to the situation of democracy activists in Iran. You think that's a... No, no, because different contexts, different contexts. Yeah. I agree with you, there's different contexts. But, but the point is, you don't uh, engage with countries uh, that, that uh, share your views, your values in its entirety. I, I have uh, extremely good relations, to be fair. The United States leadership has been very forthcoming in my defense uh, because of the principle of democracy and human rights. Of course, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I, but then you don't erase, as I said, you know, the history with the fact that, you know, in the past decades, how the blacks uh, and the colored people have been treated. But my point is that even with that happening, you have, you continue to have good, very good relations with the country. But my point, um, my, my concern is this. When you come to China, you have different rule. You know, huge uh, criticism or question gives me why I maintain good relations with China or with Iran. But with the rest, France is fine. Even with countries that continue to bomb uh, civilians and hospitals and schools and mosques and churches, and they are tolerated. So I, that's why I have this problem with what I call the narrative of the Western capitals. I just want to be, to be consistent. Yes, many countries, we, we, we don't share their aspirations, but we still engage. And similarly with Iran. And Iran, you know, it, I mean, it may be on the threshold of a nuclear weapon. It threatens many of its Arab neighbors, not just Israel. That's all OK. Well, um, America can have a nuclear weapon. It's fine. Uh, Russia has. Uh, Israel has. But Iran, you, you uh -huh. cannot. But do you think but it would be a breach of the non-proliferation treaty for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon? But non-proliferation treaty is, of course, selective. I don't believe in um, nuclear you know, power uh, armaments. Uh, even in the matter of AUKUS, we have made it a stand. And Malaysia is strong against non, uh, 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 with, on the issue of non-proliferation. But uh, again, the narrative cannot be selective. You say yes to one country and you say no to the other country. And that's what's happening in this world. And people are getting more critical. And, and I know, because I engage with countries in the global south. Some wouldn't have the courage because of a number of reasons to speak up. But this is what is being shared. So let's talk about China. You mentioned China already. I mean, you do maintain good relations with China. You particularly warned against, you know, it, and it, a rat, further ratcheting of tensions in the whole region, in the South China Sea, also between the United States and China. What's your big fear? You, you fear a war between the US and China. Is that your greatest fear? Yeah, we have expressed concern. That's why when I was in San Francisco for the APEC meeting, uh, and the day before there was this uh, meeting uh, between uh, Xi Jinping and President Biden, we welcomed that. And I said it publicly, this is something that is so reassuring uh, and gives some semblance of uh, peace uh, and, and uh, for the region. <clears throat> Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I completely disagree with this issue of heightening tension and creating this, this uh, Chinophobia. I say from our prism, from a Malaysian position, we don't have that problem. So don't impose and don't try and influence us against because 
we maintain excellent bilateral relations with America. Cumulatively, America is the greatest investor into Malaysia. We continue to encourage them. But at the same time, China has been very positive and aggressive in terms of investment into Malaysia and very important trading partner. So we'll continue. And do you think the United States is going too far in its effort? I mean, China accuses it of trying to contain the People's Republic of China. Um, the US has put on all sorts of sanctions to limit you know, the exports of high technology and stuff like that. Do you think America is going too far down a, a Cold War route? This is the Chinese accusation. It's no matter of Chinese uh, accusation. This is selective. I mean, I, I, I completely disagree, but I think I believe in open trade. You teach us open trade. When it comes to affect a bit of your interest, that you start protectionism and selective uh, position or policies. And that's the problem. Do you believe in open trade? Trade, then see. I mean, uh, we have, uh, in the 5G, we have selected Ericsson, right? But we see since that growing uh, technology, technological advancement of, uh, say, Huawei. So I'm open to the idea of having Huawei too. But you ask me in an open process, you know, why did we select Ericsson? Is it because it is European? Maybe it's because it's not Chinese? It's not our consideration. We thought it's the best. It has the capacity and capability. And we uh, take it. I mean, uh, I want countries to see that in that light. We take what is best for our country. Ours is a small, <laughs> developing country. We need to engage with most countries. Uh, we benefited immensely by trade. We are working in fast track for the uh, EU uh, PTA and uh, uh, trade uh, agreement FTA, and and uh, to my mind that is uh, crucial for our survival and our economic survival. But looking again at the China-U.S. competition that's, that's heating up in Asia. Um, I mean, we can see that the Chinese essentially think that it's time for the U.S. to be getting out of Asia, that, that you know, this is China's rightful kind of backyard. Um, are you concerned about the consequences for smaller countries like uh, Malaysia or ASEAN more widely if China is the only sort of only big beast in town? After all, I mean, it claims pretty much the entirety of the South China Sea, including a number of... Uh, features, geographical features, which are claimed by Malaysia as well. We do consider China a beast or America as a beast. You don't want one beast, we don't want two beasts, two. My position is, and we, uh, we have never precluded American presence. I mean, there are so, also you know, military exercises uh, which cannot be deemed to be provocative with the United States, with Australia, with the UK, with New Zealand. Now, we are continuing. So people don't understand, because the problem is, you, you package into one, one um, particular position. Now, because we say we are friendly with China, as if we are not friendly with the West. It's not true. Because, as I said, investments, military, uh, even uh, co collaborations, continues. Even with the United States. Now, of course, uh, I'm not talking about um, uh, you know, excessive sort of military presence. I disagree because it would be deemed a provo provocation. But otherwise, uh, we're continuing. I mean, uh, we as a, even the new reform government have not stopped or discouraged any engagement, including military engagement with the United States. Now, Prime Minister, I know we're out of time, but I would just like to ask a, a more kind of personal question about, you, about your own history. Um, some of our viewers will know that, that you were someone who spent many years in jail um, on trumped-up charges, some related to antiquated colonial-era sodomy uh, uh, legislation from the year 1860 or so. Um, you are now Prime Minister of Malaysia. How do you reflect on that political life that you have led so far, um, on your own fight for personal but also democratic freedoms, and also on the use of this kind of antiquated legislation, which you know India has got rid of, this Section 377, it was in Singapore as well. Mm -hmm. 
is it time for Malaysia to, to be junking some of these colonial mm. laws? Now, what I've learned is, of course, um, the uh, sufferings during the tragic years, more than ten and a half years, uh, back and forth into prison, in solitary confinement. Of course, it's tough, but which means it strengthened my resolve that the country must be democratic. The uh, uh, injustice and inflicted upon me should not uh, affect any other uh, Malaysian. The country must evolve into a vibrant, mature democracy. Now, some antiquated laws are present. As a country, we do not accept um, gay marriage or uh, public display of homosexuality or lesbianism. There's a position of Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, overall. There's the right decision of our people who have their faith and their values and should not impose upon them. But should we harass people with their own personal views? No. That is why some antiquated laws have to be reviewed. You should not harass people. Um, but then uh, public display and to legitimize no, there's the sentiment of the, of the people at large. It's not just the Muslims. When you talk to general Christians or Buddhists or Hindus in Malaysia, that is their sentiment. And in a democratic tradition, respect, not only the majority, the vast majority, almost unanimity in terms of these views. But we have a problem because the West feels that uh, it's all antiquated. We don't. But to use this to oppress people, uh, this is a position which I've taken. You cannot use any law and, and abuse the process and uh, uh, make uh, the judiciary subservient to the executive, as we have seen in the past. Prime Minister, thank you very much for your time today.